Okay, before Kweku, Nana will make a, a welcome address. No, remarks. Remarks from the chairman. Kweku. Thank you. I would like to thank the MC for his very kind words about me. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the President and his Executive Committee for doing me the honor of asking me to chair this important event. <clears throat> when I was invited uh, to preside, I wondered why this invitation <clears throat> would be extended to a village chief. Um, <clears throat> now, our president is an engineer, and I'm sure he dug very deeply <clears throat> into mind. I would say that um, some Three quarters of a, I would say that um, some th three quarters of a century ago, uh, if you like, during the um, Second World War, I was a student. <clears throat> I was a pupil at Azokore Methodist School. Thank you. And I encountered a, gent a student called Albert Boahe. Before then, I had been referred to as uh, a clever little boy. All this came to an end when Albert Boahe arrived. He used to walk three and a half miles from Jabin <coughs> either way. And he was a whiz kid in arithmetic. Very soon we realized that he had a competitive edge on us. There were people who competed with him. But if you had somebody who could score 100% in arithmetic, what would somebody with 80% in, say, geography do? So invariably, he came top. <coughs> and um, we had a certain tradition in Azokori, everybody saluted people who uh, have done well. So from 40 to 20, they'll come and salute those from 20 to 1st, and then three people will remain and you salute the, the first boy. And I, all I can say is that I saluted him more often than he saluted me. <laughs> of course, I was relieved when I went to Achimota but my relief was short-lived because I met another numbers man, J.S. Jackson, who was a wizard in arithmetic, algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. And um, to cut matters short, he was the first person to score four straight A's in his higher school certificate examination or the equivalent of advanced. That was in pure maths, Applied Mathematics, uh, Chemistry, and Physics. He was named um, even on the National Radio Zeto Y. Another experience with this um, proposition was when I was an attorney in the legal department of the World Bank. I thought I had done well when I worked on a certain document with all the figures and so forth. <clears throat> but I was summoned by my superiors and I was given a stern lecture because a certain zero was missing and a certain um, comma had been misplaced. And when I tried to give the excuse that, oh, these were the typos made by the secretary, I was sternly rebuked that I was responsible for that document <clears throat> and that a missing zero could have 
dire consequences in the economy of a particular country, and I should do the proofreading myself. And so I went on again <clears throat> in the area of petroleum. You know, when a country hits oil, I recall the Minister of Natural Resources of Ghana in 1971 giving thanks to God with a bottle of oil that Ghana had found oil. He didn't realize that the secret was in the numbers because when you go to, <coughs> you proceed to negotiate a mining <coughs> a petroleum agreement, um, you have something called the fiscal regime. Fiscal regime has all the elements which sound in figures, the royalty, the tax, the um, uh, <coughs> income tax charges, the uh, equity participation, the level of equity participation, you compute all those things, and then you have what is known as the government take. So there, it was a relief that I would retire one day into my um, traditional milieu, and then again, when I was in the palanquin, and with all my citizens, you know, in a long procession, uh, in situations where the importance of achieve was determined by the size of the retinue, and I was pleased with all the um, adulation and the um, uh, <clears throat> from um, celebrating behind me and all the rest, I really realized that even in traditional area, numbers do count. So it is with this experience of numbers counting that I will wait patiently for our distinguished lecturer to give a real expectation on what really counts, the relevance of numbers to planning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nana Chair. At this point, we invite um, our president, Mr. Kweku Asebonsu, to say a few words. But before that, let me again um, recognize another eminent Ghanaian who is hiding in the second row there. Mr. Emil Short is here. We recognize you, sir. Thank you. I recently read an article by a veteran Ghanaian journalist who lamented that some speakers at functions devote a lot of time, of the allotted time, to salutations, trying to that is trying to recognize all important dignitaries and ending the salutations with all protocols observed. This, according to the writer, incurs the wrath of those not recognized. I'm not going to make that mistake, as there are many dignitaries in the auditorium this evening. And thus, please permit me to say, Nana Chairperson, Dr. Nana Susubribi Krobia Asante, Paramount Chief of Asante Asokore, Excellencies, distinguished dignitaries, ladies, gentlemen, and students. On behalf of the Executive Committee and members of the Ghana Association of Former International Civil Servants, GAFIX, I welcome you all to the GAFIX Annual Public Lecture under the title Numbers Count, Strengthening the Culture of Planning. The topic is apt at this crucial moment in our development, and the lecture is to be delivered by a GAFIX member Dr. Andrew Akutu, a former chairperson of the National Population Council, a retired director of the United Nations Population Fund, and an accomplished entrepreneur. Lashibi. If you know, I, I'm sure you, when you hear of Lashibi, you know where Lashibi. Lashibi Funeral Homes. Nana Chairperson is also a GAFEX member. 
GAFIX launched the first and second public lectures in the year 2002-2003, and it's relaunching the annual public lectures starting this year, 2019. For this new series, a selected member of the association or an accomplished Ghanaian in the chosen field will be invited to deliver the lecture each year. GAFICs constitute a pool of highly qualified Ghanaians with extensive experience and expertise in many scientific, social, economic, and related fields. This store of knowledge has been garnered from working with governments across the globe. The UN, its department, funds, specialized agencies, the Bretton Woods institutions, African Development Bank, Commonwealth Secretariat, ECOWAS African Union, as well as all reputable international organizations. GAFIX has produced a brochure which outlines the rationale for its establishment and the assistance extended to date in giving back to society. The brochure has been distributed to all, and thus I will not bore you by going through it. However, it is important to re-emphasize some of the contents. Yes, the primary aim of GAFIX is to give back to society as a social responsibility. Members are appreciative of the sound education they received in Ghana, which helped to open doors of employment for them in major institutions inside and outside the country. This makes who we are now. The other equally important aim is to foster the social interest of members and especially assist new members with their resettlement and adjustment after being away for a number of years working abroad. Nana Chairperson, Excellencies, distinguished dignitaries, ladies, gentlemen, and students, to better position GAFICS to contribute to the social economic development of the nation, members have been grouped into six clusters by discipline as follows. Economy, trade, investment, health, population, nutrition, social development. Cluster three is education. Then we have peace and governance, infrastructure and environment, and lastly, food and agriculture. The clusters provide a forum for focus analysis and deliberation on topical issues by aspects in the respective fields. The clusters will make recommendations and propose, pro, uh, propose measures and strategies to boost policy making and implementation. In short, GAFIX is committed to sharing its technical knowledge and expertise with various government entities and other institutions and would welcome any collaborative ventures. We acknowledge the support received from the UN system through the acting UN resident coordinator, Ms. Sylvia Lopez Ekra, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration for allowing this public lecture to kickstart the celebration of the UN Day, which falls tomorrow. We wish to thank the preparatory committee chaired by Dr. Alex Abouaji for their sacrifice in putting together this event. The question on the minds of many gathered here, I believe, is what next after the lecture? Is it another talk show? We wish to assure you that the transcript of the lecture will be produced and the strategies to enhance policy making and implementation submitted to the government. Once again, GAFIX is ready to give back to society as part of this social responsibility and to paraphrase Methodist hymn book 400 stanza 4, take our intellect and use in the development of Ghana. Thank you for honoring the invitation. Thank you, Your Excellency, Mr. President. At this point, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Abdelrahman Jalo, UNESCO Rep on behalf of the UN system.
Bonsoir. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> Nana, chère personne. Nana, ce subrivi, Krobea, à santé, Paramount Chief of à santé, à Socorro. I hope that I pronounce very well. <laughs> Engineer Kwabude Osebonsu, President of the Ghana Association of Former International Civil Servants, GAFIC. Dr. Andrew Arkutu, GAFIC member. Dignitaries present, distinguished members of GAFIC, distinguished invitees, dear students, dear friends of the media. I'm very honored to be here with you to present this brief remark on behalf of the UN Resident Coordinator Ad Interim, Mrs. Sylvia Lopez Ekra. This public uh, lecture organized by the Ghana Association of Former International Civil Servants to mark the 74th United Nations Day in Ghana deserves our commendation. We also recognize the efforts of many others who bring the work of the United Nations to the fore as part of the celebration of the birth of this global organization. We acknowledge Ghana's contribution to the ideals and vision of the United Nations to meet the needs of the people we serve. This is indicative of the passion and the zeal these retired international civil servants have for the work of the United Nations and by extension, the public sector. Thank you to this dedication. And so let me take this opportunity to thank GAFIC for organizing this event in observance of the United Nations Day, which falls on tomorrow, 24 October, the day marking the anniversary of the entry into force in 19. We cannot address the many development challenges and we cannot plan effectively without numbers to work with. Numbers inform our work, numbers tell us whether we are on track, we're making progress or not, numbers determine where we need to pay more attention. Numbers indeed count and numbers matter. However, numbers alone do not measure our development progress. The quantity of change, such as number of years spent in school life expectancy or increase we cannot address the many development challenges and we cannot plan effectively without numbers to work with. Numbers inform our work. Numbers tell us whether we are on track, we're making progress or not. Numbers determine where we need to pay more attention. Numbers indeed count and numbers matter. However, numbers alone do not measure our development progress. The quantity of change, such as number of years spent in school life expectancy or increase in income alone do not add up. Quantity must include quality, the impact. We cannot make better impact when we know how much work we need to do and how much we need to invest in what we do. The ability to make such informed decision is determined by the availability of data. Data across all sectors, including education, sciences, communication, and culture. Data across all sectors which are systematically governed, analyzed, and used to make the choice that affect our people. As we work towards meeting the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, with its accompanying 169 targets and set of indicators for benchmarking and tracking global progress, we must remember that data is central to measuring that progress. And we saw that evidently 
in the voluntary national review report. The United Nations stand committed to offer the needed technical support to strengthen our planning efforts to make numbers count. Nanacher, ladies and gentlemen, like all present here, I look forward to the presentation of Dr. Andrew Arkutu as he walks us through the details that support the premise that number counts and that to make meaningful impact into the lives of people. We need a systematic culture of planning that measures the various interventions with the actual needs on the ground. And on a personal note, I wish to take this opportunity to engage, to say that it will be with a lot of opportunism and a lot of humility that uh, I will call on your expertise and your wisdom to help us carrying out our mission here on the service of the people of Ghana. Thank you very much for your attention. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marian Pakpa. I'm the Chief Director of the Ministry of Planning. The moderator has asked that I introduce myself since um, he wasn't aware I was here. I, Nana Chairman, and I'll follow the protocol by the President and uh, members of the high table. Uh, let me begin by giving apology evening to you all. It's a pleasure to be invited by the Ghana Association of Former International Civil Servants and to be asked to deliver brief remarks at this public lecture on the theme, Numbers Count, Strengthening the Culture of Planning. Let me begin by commending the association for its continued interest as a body of professionals in the development of our dear country and for creating opportunities to make valuable contributions in this regard. The theme of this evening's lecture is relevant if we want to ensure sustainable development of our nation and to ensure that we leave no one behind. The scientific process of planning in its various forms includes consideration to the spatial, economic, social, and environmental spheres of our nation. In Ghana, our planning efforts have grown from small spatial planning departments in the early colonial days to national and subnational structures that have the primary mandate to oversee the planning activities in the country. The planning functions in Ghana is guided by Articles 86 and 87 of the 1992 Constitution, Acts 479 and 480 of 1994, Act 936 of 2011, 2016, pardon me, and LI 2232. At the constitutional apex of the planning function in Ghana is the National Development Planning Commission, which by Article 87 shall advise the President on development planning, policy, and strategy. This article indicates that the real act of planning and policy strategy is thus vested in the president and in his cabinet. For the first time in our governance structure, the president of the republic has seen it fit and necessary to have a minister and a ministry of planning to provide executive direction to our planning efforts. Indeed, governments over the years have developed several policy frameworks that have provided the policy direction for the overall planning of the country. Distinguished guests, effective planning depends on real data, especially of the number of people the plans see, seek to impact. But the question remains, what are the characteristics of these numbers? Who are they with regards to their sex, age, location, levels of education, abilities, vulnerabilities, culture, etc.? These issues are of paramount importance if our plans are to succeed. Good reliable data, disaggregated information is essential for good planning. Data based on national, regional, or district averages alone 
connotes a certain level of appreciation of the situation. However, it marks the specific differences that exist among the specific sections or groups in the population that must be addressed to achieve equality. Furthermore, sound planning thrives on timeliness of data. Unfortunately, this has been one of the major weaknesses in our planning culture, whereby undue delays in the collection, analysis, and release of data impacts negatively on the plans developed. Another area of concern in our culture of planning is the weak linkage between development planning and spatial planning. This has created a conceptual and practical gap in the specializations of planning. The D-Link, therefore, has resulted in development plans without appropriate spatial dimensions and spatial plans which satisfies aesthetic purposes instead of responding to development problems, among others. These examples of deficits in the planning culture of the country present fundamental impediments to genuine harmonization and coordination of development initiatives and implementation. The achievement of the ambitious goals of the 2030 Agenda depends now more than ever on an inclusive and integrated planning system underpinned by a dependable planning culture. This makes planning not only desirable, but compelling in the light of a highly competitive world. As such, government is putting in place relevant mechanisms to ensure that our planning efforts do not only result in numbers, but our delivery is meaningful. In this respect, we have integrated the SDGs with our national development plans to ensure that we are measuring what we have set out to achieve. This has forced us to relook at our statistical, to relook at our statistical systems to make them more efficient, robust, and responsive. We have also developed budget codes and mapped these programs with activities to help us track our spending uh, and how this impacts on our development planning and to proffer suggestions on how to improve on this. I therefore welcome your recommendations, as has been alluded to by the President, and wish you well in your deliberations and look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you. is that is Ghana Studies Car Service. But indeed, we have to take a closer look at this question as in who generates and who certifies it. My fourth question would relate to the issue of how are these numbers used? So you can have the numbers out there, they are using the numbers, and I'm going to make reference to a couple of statistics that Dr. Akutu talked about and walk you through how these numbers are used and the need to contextualize these numbers. Then obviously, as I said, our work is being done for us, so it is important to say a few words that Ghana Studies Car Service is putting in place to ensure that these questions that I'm going to address with you, in, I'm going to discuss with you in the near future, will be in the position to, uh, to resolve them. So the first issue which, which has to do with which numbers count takes us directly to the issue of quality of numbers. And once we talk about quality of numbers, there are key issues that do come up. One has to do with the integrity of the number. The other has to do with the comparability of the number. The other has to do with the reliability of the number, accessibility of the number. So there are quite a number of clear factors that one would have to take into consideration if you are talking about which numbers count. And I'm going to make reference to two numbers that were mentioned during the speech. One had to do with the population growth rate. And this is key for us because we are about to do our census. It's a decennial activity. And in between, we do annual projections. How do we do these annual projections? At Ghana Studies Car Service, we take into consideration two factors instead of the three theoretical factors that one would have to take into consideration. And this is where we need to appreciate the need of looking at numbers that we are using and the limitations that are associated with the numbers. So first, we take into consideration fertility and mortality. These are the two factors that we use in doing the annual projections. For some reason, we do not use migration and make a strong assumption that net migration is zero. 
inflows and outflows balance off. It isn't an assumption that we are doing because of luxury of it, but it's an assumption that we are compelled to do because of our inability to work together as a nation, as institutions, to get the relevant migration data to enable us to take into consideration all the three factors that would allow us to do the projections. So the 2.5 that was mentioned in terms of population growth rate is using two out of the three factors. The second, the second example relates to the issue of unemployment that Dr. Akutu mentioned as far as um, 7.1 unemployment rate was announced by the Minister for Employment and Labor Relations. I'm going to go further into that, but the 7.1, it's always important to ask yourself how was it computed? Which numbers are we talking about? So again, as a country with a huge informal sector, we are internationalizing, so we look at international benchmarks and say that by the ILO standards, you should have worked for one hour in the last seven days, any form of work. So you do that, you go by the strict definition, people who are not engaged, people who are seeking and who are available. So that strict definition gives you an unemployment figure of 3.6. So you, satisf you, satisf you satisfy the conditions of ILO. Then you look into your context and you say that, what kind of availability are we talking about? What kind of seeking are we talking about? So different agencies begin to relax that strict definition. Then in one perspective, we relax the seeking condition and we come up with a figure of about 7.1. And in another, in another breath, we say that, let's relax some of the domains of seeking and make um, availability constant. So then Ghana Studies Car Service puts up, puts up a figure of 8.4%. Which numbers are we talking about? What is the context in which we are using these numbers? Indeed, what got me into Ghana Studies Car Service as an academic is during my lectures, I use Ghana Studies Car Service data, and always I try to reproduce the data and ask myself, are these numbers consistent with what is informing policy? For those of us who've had the benefit of experiencing how statistics are generated in other countries, you share with me that a number of academic, academic institutions provide parallel data, parallel numbers, by which we use as basis to validate what the National Statistical Service does. So once we want to think about which numbers, there is the need to have an angle where we look at the reproducibility of the numbers that we put out there. Because the quality of the planning, the outcome of the planning, would hinge on the fact that the numbers are of good quality. The second question has to do with how do we get these numbers? Again, I'm going to give you a couple of examples relating to what Ghana Studies Car Service does. One critical example has to do with the generation of consumer price index inflation, which is one of our key statistics as a service. We do monthly market price read price, the quantity of a commodity might sometimes even be tenfold of it and in other instances might be 20 fold of it, but at the same price. So it is important for us to understand as a nation, how are we generating these numbers? How do we get these numbers? And this takes us to the third issue, which has to do with who generates and who certifies these numbers. As I said earlier on, it might come across easily that it is the role of Ghana Studies Car Service. But indeed, as we heard from Dr. Akut, how transparent are we? How do we harmonize these figures? So a simple inflation figure, which has to do with a basket of commodities, Bank of Ghana doesn't make it open, Ghana Studies Car Service doesn't make it open, so there's no transparency, and on the corridors, we begin to argue about whether it's 1.0, 1.2, simply because there's no transparency in what we do, as far as the generation of these numbers are concerned. In the wisdom of the Parliament of United Kingdom, their National Statistical Authority has two arms. The arm that focuses on the production of the statistics and another arm that regulates the, the statistics that is out there. Because you cannot be a producer and at the same time think about regulating or certifying what should be official statistics or what should be a national statistics. And continuously what they are doing is to ensure that there is separation between the production arm of statistics and the certification of statistics. So moving forward, Ghana Studies Car Service, quality of data, quality processes is one of the things that we are emphasizing as far as the production of statistics is concerned. 
The fourth question that I talked about had to do with how are these numbers used? These numbers, we put them out there, and as I indicated earlier on, they do not have any documentation in terms of the context in which these numbers are used. I'm happy the issue of free SHS was talked about. In what context do we use these numbers in such a way that it reflects the situation that we have on the ground? I talked about our informal sector earlier on. If we have such a, high, such a huge informal sector and you put out a statistic that is benchmarked against an international definition, how do you accommodate that informality? So the context in which we use these numbers is very important and the limitations that are associated with it is critical. So this is what Ghana Studies Car Service moving forward we are doing. On the 12th and 13th of next month, we'll be celebrating the African Statistics Day. And what we're doing differently this time round is to have an opportunity where we put out the methodological paper on the computation of price indices, a methodological paper on the computation of unemployment, so that people would find the need that for each particular statistic, you need to produce it in different forms. One of the challenges that I had personally since I joined the service had to do with don't put out more than one statistic for an indicator. I said, it doesn't work like that in academia. Because if you talk of unemployment or even inflation, you have to look at it from different statistics, different perspectives, sorry. And this is exactly what I explained to you earlier on. You don't talk about unemployment of 7.1 and run, out, run with it and say that this is because of A, B, C, D. When we do not know that, this unemployment is relaxing the seeking assumption, or this unemployment is relaxing the availability assumption, or this unemployment is relaxing the kind of job, the decent work that one requires to do. So clearly, there is the need for us to rethink our approach. And again, I'm happy some of them, Dr. Akutu talked about, one had to do with moving away from the traditional data sources. And that is something that we are emphasizing on. We are so glued to surveys and censuses, forgetting that our daily activities is a way of generating data. And one of the things that personally I talk about is we need to get to a point where data generation is a byproduct. The only way you can ensure that is if you underpin all your engagement with technology. If you have a good technological infrastructure, your movement, your in and out, your engagement would indirectly generate data for your use. All that we need to think about is how do we use this administrative data, how do we use this um, big data that is available for us in our day-to-day -day activities. The second thing that we want to talk about as far as what Ghana Studies Car Service is doing is the fact that the president just last month assented to the Studies Car Service Act 2019, Act 1003. And this act clearly gives Ghana, Ghana Studies Car Service the mandate to coordinate and certify what an experimental statistics is, what an official statistics is, and what a national statistics is. And we don't do this on our own, but it gives us the opportunity to form what we call the National Advisors, Advisory Committee on the Production and Use of Statistics, NACPUS which will come together and gradually the intent is that we would end a survey, we'll conduct a census. So I'll conclude, as I said earlier on, with a few remarks on the upcoming 2020 census. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Ghana Statistical Service is putting in all that it has to do from a, te a technical point of view and is very confident that March 2020, we're going to have our the senior census. We are advising strongly against what occurred in 2010, where it was moved from March to September. The reason was to help push for Ghana Studies Car Service and for and Ghana for that matter to do the March 2020 census. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Prof. Heavy stuff. Now, one minute. So we are going to allow 25 minutes of Q&A. 20 minutes for you, 
five to ten minutes for them. Um, we would ask the people with the ambulatory microphones to stand by. You raise your hand, I call you, they're my guests to you. A, you introduce yourself. You indicate who your question is for specifically, the speaker, discussant A or discussant B, and keep your intervention short, brief, and to the point, so that you can take as many questions as possible. So, over to you. Going. Going. Yes. Let me repeat. The ball is in your court now. It's your turn to speak. You can raise questions, make comments, but tell us your name. I see a young man on the other side who has the courage to start us off. Give us your name. Tell us who your question is directed to specifically and try to keep it brief and to the point. Thank you. He needs help with the mic. Good evening. I am Eliza Asasi, and my questions are to Dr. Samuel Kopina Enim. And you spoke about the production of uh, statistics. And I want to ask, how does the Ghana Statistical Service uh, deal with errors in production of st statistics? How do you deal with errors generated when you are producing results? Thank you. That's my question. Thank you. Brief and to the point. Questions, comments, suggestions, appreciations. I know the presentations were perfect. However, ask something. Yes, please. So, Dr. Juliet Twakley. Um, I'm curious about the impact uh, or the lack thereof on the figures of, of migration. Please, I don't think we all, they all heard you clearly. I said I was interested in the impact or the lack thereof of the effect of migration, which would have been the third factor to be considered in the compilation of figures. Thank you. Specifically, especially for Prof. Anim, and also for the others on the podium. I think both the speaker and the Prof. raised the issue of civil statistics. I've always found it curious that our, our civil registration system is such a mess. We have to basically wait 10 years for a census to know how many we are and where we live and what we do and so on and so forth. Give him the mic. Yeah, I, I want to know I don't know, maybe Prof, you could help, help us out. I want to know whether there is a, a harmonization of methodology in data collection between African countries. Because I say this, because when I was working in, in Kenya, 
the census of that country fell on when I was there. And uh, the parameters they brought, they were really many. I mean, it's very similar to what we do here. Then I came to Ghana in 2010 or thereabouts. And a guy just walked into my place, uh, said I should give him the, uh, my water bill and those things. Nothing. This, in Kenya, this man sat with me for about 30, 40 minutes, going through a whole, uh, you know, uh, schedule of uh, critical uh, information that was required. So I want to know whether, in order to compare statistics on our continent, whether data gathered in Ghana can be, uh, I don't know, uh, whether there's some form of a harmonization of your procedures, please. Thank you. Thank you. I see, Prof, you are already on your feet. So, you Thank you very much for these um, questions. Let me begin with the first question on how um, we address errors in our data collection process. I would attempt not to be too theoretical on it and give you practical examples. So the theoretical bit has to do with, it depends on the type of error that we're talking about, whether it's error at the data collection point, sampling error or non-sampling error. But a typical example that I want to give has to do with correcting errors with our prize um, data that I talked about earlier on. So hitherto, that is before the rebasing, we were using a particular software that had been programmed in the generation of the statistic. So we had little control on how to check or verify the numbers that we're getting out of it. So in the last six months, what we did as a service is to say to ourselves that, why don't you use other software with the same data so that you can reproduce the statistic that you are putting out there. So this is one way of checking it. So six, um, six months ago, we decided to use both Excel and Stata, which gives us an opportunity to say that the error is not coming from the data or it's not coming from the software. So depending on the statistic that you're talking about or the type of error, we have different approaches that we do it. Internally, we ensure that if a staff responsible for a particular statistic generates it, it goes through a number of um, levels to ensure that the statistic is minimal of errors. The second question is a is pre, is pretty difficult one in terms of estimating the impact. We've not made an attempt to um, discuss the level of impact. This came up during one of our meetings of the Technical Advisory Committee on how we can make population projections after the um, 2020 census. So we're going to collaborate with the Regional Institute for Population Studies to, to, get, to get a sense of the impact of not taking into account migration. In any case, the only way you can calculate the impact is if you have a, if you have a sense of the extent to which net migration is not zero. So for instance, if we get good working relationship with Ghana Immigration Service and they give us, even from the airport point of view, the extent to which there are variations in inflows and outflows, then it will give us a sense to calculate the extent to which um, we are not doing things right as far as the, pro the projections are concerned. The third question has to do with the um, CRVS, and I think I'm very happy that question has come up. The reason why I'm happy is that I was over ambitious a few months ago when I said that 2030 death um, registry and all the other agencies that would help us get our uh, good CRVS data that we need. So that by 2025, we can get a sense of how we can use population registers to get the needed population data. As I indicated, 2030 might be over ambitious around this time, but we are hoping that closer to 2030, we would get a sense of how our population registers from CRVS compare with our traditional census, so that moving forward, we can see how we replaced CRVS or population registers with um, traditional censuses. The fourth question on harmonization, the response is that there is very minimal engagement on the continent as far as production of statistics or compar comparability of statistics across countries, so among countries in the region is concerned. Relative to what happens in other continents like the EU, where countries are obliged to produce a certain set of statistics, we don't have that mechanism um, in this part of the world. 
Again, the good side of this conversation is that we are about entering into a regional project with the World Bank, which has to do with harmonization and improving on, of statistics among three, sorry, six um, African countries, which Ghana is a part. And the whole idea is to, how, is to begin that conversation of how to make statistics comparable across um, countries. So we're looking forward to this opportunity to do that harmonization. Even internally, that is where our concern is as Ghana Statistical Service. Internally, we should begin to think about how do we harmonize certain basic things. So for instance, the coding of regions in Ghana. We use the serpentile approach for Ghana Statistical Service. But we get other agencies that we tell them that for us to compare what is happening at the regional level between, for instance, Ghana Police Service and Ghana Statistical Service, let all of us have that serpentile approach. And that conversation has not reached the level that we want. So within country, our focus is how do we ensure harmonization across the MDAs? And this is what the NACPUS is going to do for us based on the Statistical Service Act. Thank you. Dr. Akutu, Leticia, anything to add? Dr. Akutu, please. I do not wish to be cynical, but forgive me if I say that, as somebody said, for forms of government, let fools contend. We can argue about the harmonization, the completeness, and all the various aspects of the quality of data, and so on and so forth. But for a simple thing like civil registration, we can do this. The problem we have is that there is no compliance. Even here in Accra, children are born and their birth is not registered. I have it anecdotally. If you sue me in court, I would deny you. That here, even here in Accra, people die. They are buried without the event being recorded. So you can imagine what is happening in our districts and so on and so forth. And also, I think too much is centralized. There are too many, because the districts need a lot of information. They are empowered by our constitution to be the initiators of the development process for which funds are allocated to the districts. But what encouragement do the districts have to collect, what capacity do they have to collect information relevant to their districts, which they can use for planning purposes? I think that we can pay attention there. And also, let me go give you an example. I think it was 77 or 78, I visited the University of uh, uh, Makerere, the medical school. And they showed me a map, an epidemiological map of Uganda. All the information there, that map showed you what the disease pattern is, the distribution of diseases within Uganda. Because it's not uniform. It's not uniform in Ghana. People who live along uh, rivers and so on have peculiar diseases and so on, which people living in Ghana do not have. But it is important for the people working in the health sector to know that if you are going to uh, this particular region, these are the diseases that you must be aware of. This was not done at a big national level. This was the data collected from clinics, uh, from outpatient departments and so on and so forth, which the Department of Epidemiology or Public Health have put together and made the map. So we can do, we can simplify the process and also we can enforce some compliance. Children who are, children born in Ghana must be registered and parents must be encouraged to get a, a, a birth certificate for purposes of enrolling in schools and so on and so forth. We can start at that level, show them how to use this data for their own planning purposes. Yeah, 
uh, Chair, I think that we at times overemphasize production of data because we have data but the use of it. The statistical service has churned out so much data. As we stand, our teenage pregnancy rate is 14.4. That is data that we have. What are we doing with the data? If data capture is our issue, there's so many avenues that we can capture data. Every Saturday we bury our dead. If data capture is that important to us, we can even get it from the churches if we're not getting, because everybody goes to church before they go uh, to be buried. Everybody goes to the mosque. I think the story I gave is to shift our focus on what do we want with the data that we have. We have data, what are we using the data for? Data for me is like your limb. The more you use, the better it gets. If we're using the data that statistical service has churned out, then we can tell them that we want this kind of data again to enhance the data. Why do we need the data? Why are we not registering our children? How, why are we not registering our dead? Because we are not using that data for decision making. We're collecting the data and deciding on the site. So for me, I think the focus should be, what are we doing with the data that we have now? Our growth rate of 2.5, as Prof said, is that where we want to? We have a population policy that says we want to get to a growth rate of 1.6, 1.5 by a certain, a certain time. What are we doing to get there? That is why I gave the BP example. Because we are not just looking at our BPs going up, we have an optimal BP that the BP medicines are supposed to control. We have a sugar level that the, the diabetic medicines are supposed to control. So the data that we have, what quality of life do we want? I think that should drive what we use our data for. If 14% teenage pregnancy is acceptable to us, then we are okay. But if it is not acceptable to us and it should not be acceptable to us, what are we doing with that data? Volta region has the highest teenage pregnancy rate. We have maternal mortality highest in the north. In the eastern, and then anemia highest over there. Child mortality highest. Stunted growth, 20% of our children are stunted. That is data. What are we doing to reduce the stunting? When the world found out that we had smallpox and we didn't want, what did we do? We eliminated it. When we have polio and we don't want it, what do we do? Tomorrow is what polio do. So we are eliminating it. We are not just tracking the polio with the data. So the data, how do we make sure that the data we have, we are using it? It is like exercising. The, the more you exercise, the better you get at it. The more we use the data, the better we we'll get at it. We should use data and fixation on collection of data, for me, I don't know. Statistical service collects a lot of data. Data for me, it's, uh, as a medic, it's like going to the lab. You go to the lab, the doctor, the lab technician reads your lab results. You keep reading the lab results without interpreting it for you to get well. That is how I see it. So the data should be used and statistical service, I'm sure, will be energized to collect data and we'll all be happy to harmonize the data because we've seen what the data is being used for. What are we dying from? We do not know because we just bury our dead. Is it acceptable for us to die at 46, at 36, when others are dying at 85 and 90? If it is not acceptable, then we should use even that data to have implementation so that we also improve our, our life expectancy and the quality of life that we, we want to live. So for me, my issue is that usage of the data. Adolf looked at the data and he said, within this range are normal people, are healthy people. So how do we get majority of people in this normal range? Not just calculating the data and collecting the data. So those are my comments. Thank you. So consume the data, don't just produce. There was a hand up there earlier. Oh, oh Prof. Okay. Good evening. Um, my name is Francis Dodu from the University of Ghana. Uh, Dr. Akutu, I salute you. Yeah? <laughs> I used to work under him also. Um, uh, government statistician, I was hoping that one of your responses to the fourth question would have been to speak about the, the, the fact that not everybody gets the long form in the census. Pierre, please.
introduce yourself, say who you are addressing your question to, and then brief to the point. I'm Kopnata Benson, a retired uh, medical officer. My question actually goes to the head of the National Operating Council. And for me, it's, it's an issue that bothers me a great deal. Population is central to our Dasha development. It has um, okay, there's a contribution yes. back there. George. The name is George Insier. I'd like to uh, commend the presentations of the speakers and particularly raise one or two points for consideration. It is quite a surprise to hear some of the remarks from our government statistician on the challenges faced in his area of work. It is surprising that it has taken us to come here to hear some challenges like the issue of migration not featuring on your calculations on the population growth rate and things like that. That is an empirical issue which one cannot understand how you can take that out of the equation and work with just fertility and mortality. When empirically, uh, the migration is a key part. From the program and planning perspective, when there is such a hue and cry on migration in this country that it is not being addressed, and we hear this, I think it is all the more disturbing. The other challenges you have raised also bring out the point that perhaps this inaugural lecture should have come much earlier. I think we need some more discussions on statistics and the use of the data and making it more usable for planning. So it is bothersome, it is bothering, and one would like to suggest that we really look at how we can improve the dialogue and the conversation in order to ensure that our data is being used properly for planning. The second question is, uh, we have a situation where a government, our government has seen the need to create, please correct me if I'm mistaken, a whole ministry of monitoring and evaluation. I have not seen it featured in what we have heard. How is that coming out? How is that being used? Not just at national level, but at sub-national level. Because this is a very, very important ministry, and we applaud the government for creating that ministry. But what work is coming out of it? Is it facing these same challenges. We never hear of it. Lastly, um, mentioned the need to use, like some of the colleagues have mentioned, the National Population Council, the work of the National Population Council, the work of government statistics. How far down is it going? At the regional level, district level, is there work being done at that level? With the decentralized planning that is being pursued by the government, and with the eminence being given to assemblymen and others in the planning, if we go to an assemblyman in your electoral area, will he, ha will he or she have the data to help us, to help the traditional authorities in doing the planning from that level? One would like to urge that from all angles and in terms of the decentralized governance, let's move our work more and more to the districts and areas. Thank you. Okay. That was a battery of three questions from George. Um, three people have spoken, but you can take one more. Yeah. Just one more. No more. Mm -hmm. Going, going, gone. Let's start with Dr. Pia. Yes, 
Thank you so much for those questions. Children getting pregnant, then it's not healthy start. If you have a population where the bed spacing for optimal bed is between two to four years, and people are having children six months after, then you should know that you're not doing well as, uh, I mean, you're not having healthy stats, which follows. And so the population, we need to talk about it. Everybody needs to talk about it, and because it affects everybody. We depend, we, are, we interdepend on each other. And quality of life, sustained quality of life is the vision of the National Population Council. And whether we like it or not, the growth rate affects us, so the data counts, the numbers will count whether we appreciate them or we do not appreciate them. I remember some years back, if you were very fat, it means your husband was taking good care of you. So we started dropping dead, and then we decided to run, because that is what the data stated, that we have to keep healthy, healthy diet, and then exercising to keep you healthy. And so that is some of the things that we all need to discuss. Can we look on the, the China, for instance, the teenage pregnancy rate is seven per thousand, seven children per thousand teenagers. That's the teenage pregnancy rate in China. And even that, they have measures in place. We have 140 per thousand. What are we doing about it? So that's some of the population issues that we all need to engage at all levels because they are the population that we're dealing with. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you all for your perspicacious questions. I think this brings us to the end of the Q&A session. Uh, we now call upon Nana Che to give his closing words of wisdom. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I think we'll all agree that the lecturer has done sub <clears throat> justice to his subject. And before I go any further, I would like us to applaud him. <clears throat> I won't attempt to uh, <clears throat> summarize what he said. Certain things stick out. He's made his case very well. Numbers count, and therefore we must count the numbers. I would like us to remember that. Numbers count, and therefore we must count the numbers. His theme is that we need to develop and strengthen a culture of data-based planning for development. We must count the numbers. And to achieve our development goals, it is critical that serious and conscientious efforts are made to ensure <clears throat> the planning, that the planning, execution, and evaluation of such programs are firmly based on the realities on the ground the numbers and the evidence before our eyes. This is a sum of what he's been telling us this evening. <clears throat> and um, of course, the reactions that we've had from the discussions and the general audience clearly attest to the depth of his message. <clears throat> from my own point of view, at a certain time, I would like us to reflect on how we relate this, <clears throat> these data to long-term development plan. Um, we've all come from our various international experiences. I recall <clears throat> that I was sent on a mission uh, from the World Bank to Korea, South Korea, in 1968 to establish 
the Korea Development Finance Corporation. So I have followed, to some extent, the developments there. In the year 2007, I was asked to give a lecture at the New Year School on the achievements of Ghana on universal primary education in the 1960s, secondary education in the 1970s, <clears throat> and tertiary education in the 1980s. And they were able to transform the economy because they developed an educated workforce. Now, we too have a constitutional provision in Article 38 of our Constitution which says that within two years of the coming into force of the Constitution, the government will roll out a plan for the introduction of primary, compulsory, basic education within 10 years. <clears throat> I wonder whether we have entirely achieved that. I know that basic education is free, but certainly not universal, nor is it compulsory. So the question that I would like to put to our statistical experts and so forth, is that what is it about our planning system which makes it difficult for us to achieve our goals? And was it about the planning system of other countries, such as Korea and Malaysia, which makes them able to achieve their goals? Um, <clears throat> I'm aware that sometimes uh, some leaders believe in bold imaginative measures. For example, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah literally decreed one day that there shall be a medical school, and that was the beginning of the medical school, which uh, provided training for many of our doc doctors. But the planning message that we've got here, the statistical data, <clears throat> the need for data-related development planning, it's very real. And the question is whether there is something which detracts from our ability to plan on a long-term basis. I sometimes wonder whether that has anything to do with our politics. Because how can you have long-term planning if every four years you have competition in programs and policies. So, in the end, even though I have been running away from numbers, I have been bold to formulate a mathematical formula. And this is the way it goes. The numerical implications of effective long-term planning are not congruent with the exigencies and dictates of partisan politics. If you agree, say so. <laughs> Thank you. That is why you get a chief, an eminent chief, and an everyday chief to chair this event. I'm done, but we are not done. We are going to ask uh, Dr. Eugenia Ba to give us a vote of thanks on behalf of graphics. Nana Chairman, representative of the Minister of Planning, representative of the uh, UN resident coordinator, namely the representative of UNESCO, representatives from the various government ministries and departments, other invited guests, students, uh, GAFIX members, I shouldn't forget them, 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have had a great evening, haven't we? On behalf of GAFIX, I wish to thank all the contributors to this event. Our special thanks go to the chairman, Nana Susubribi Krobia Asante, Asokore Hene, for the able manner in which he was able to chair the proceedings of this evening. Unknown to many of you, our Nana is over 86 years old. And yet, as mentors, we are also grateful to the um, Chief Director of Planning who represented the Minister, the various UN representatives, including the UNESCO Rep, and government officials for leaving their busy schedules to join us this evening for this lecture. To Dr. Kutu, our lecturer, we say a big thank you, and I think we should clap again for him. Besides, you were all able to share with us. To Dr. Alex Abwaji and his very dedicated team, the energetic graphics president, and others who put in the hours and the effort to help us realize this event, we say thank you. Let me also extend thanks to all GAFIX members for your cooperation in the organization. So now we are done. But as uh, I mentioned earlier with a piece of paper, there's some refreshment to be provided outside. So when you leave here, please go and uh, partake thereof. Um, if you don't mind, we will accompany our people on the podium to get out first. So if you wait just a few minutes, then afterwards we all join them. So we will follow you, Nana. And Dr. Kutu. Yeah. Well, they say you should thank me too. <laughs> <laughs> this way.
representative of the Minister of Planning, representative of the UN resident coordinator, namely the representative of UNESCO, representative from the various government ministries and departments, other invited guests, students, uh, graphics members, I shouldn't forget them, ladies and gentlemen. We have had a great evening, haven't we? On behalf of graphics, I wish to thank all the contributors to this event. Our special thanks go to the chairman, Nana Susukrimi Krobi Asante, Asokare Gene, for the able manner in which he was able to share the proceedings of this event. And not to many of you, our Nana is over 86 years old. And yet, as mentally alert as ever. In fact, more mentally alert than many of us who are supposed to be In my view, is living proof of the adage that age is only a number. Or age is just a number. We are also grateful to the um, Chief Director of Planning who represented the Minister, the various UN representatives including the UNESCO rep, and government officials for leaving their position to join us this evening for this lecture. To Dr. Kutu, our lecturer, we say a big thank you, and I think we should clap again. To our discussants, the two uh, highly regarded discussants, we say please accept our deep appreciation for a job well done. We have learned a lot from the insights you were all able to share with us. To Dr. Alex Abwaji and his very dedicated team, the energetic graphics president and others who put in the hours and the efforts to help us realize this event. We say thank you. <laughs> Let me also extend thanks to all graphics members for your cooperation in the organization of this event. I think I'm right in saying that We've gathered a lot in terms of lessons from organizing this particular event, which will stand us in good stead in the organization of future works, so that we can do them more effortlessly. Finally, we are grateful to all of you, including the students, for coming in your numbers and for contributing to the debate which have all contributed to the success of this evening's event. Once again, mercy to all of you.
me boy, baby. And yes, I made you mean so I don't know me dog, but your time is all, baby. You don't go find anybody who will love you like I did. By the time that I moved on, baby, boy, you lost. Tata me, tata me, 